Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Rob. And this is Ask Rob and Rob. Yes, thank you for joining us for Ask Rob and Rob, where we've got another couple of cracking questions from our listeners that we're going to be doing our very best to answer for you. But before we get to those, Rob, if someone's got a burning question of their own, how do they send that our way? The number you want to call is 013-808-0035, or you can go to the propertyhub.net forward slash ask and get your questions into us that way. Let's have a listen to today's first question. This is from Mark. Hi, Rob and Rob. This is Mark. Big thank you for all the fantastic information that you continue to share with everybody. I'm relatively new listening to your show. I've already been back through the numerous episodes, enjoyed them thoroughly, uh, and I've even now signed up for your magazine that I'm looking forward to uh, receiving shortly. Anyway, my question is in regards to purchasing properties at auction. I've seen several properties that I'm interested in and, of course, you know, had an attempt to review the legal pack. I guess um, some of them are fairly straightforward, others a little bit more complicated. And I've attempted to try and engage uh, legal support, professional legal support, to review the legal packs prior to bidding, but have continually been rebuffed. And I'm just wondering whether you would, A, always recommend getting professional legal advice on review, to review a legal pack before purchasing at auction, and B, whether you would actually know of specialist firms that um, really are operating within the areas of auctions and helping prospective purchasers with their uh, homework prior to bidding and purchase. Many thanks. Hey, Mark, thanks for your question. And it's great to hear from someone who's being brave in the world of auctions because you do need to be a bit brave because there's lots going on and legal packs are a big part of that now to answer your first question straight off the bat should you look at your legal packs well unless you've got experience in this area yes you should get a professional to help you out here i certainly do even after working in property for well over a decade it's something that i would do every single time and i just see it as part of the due diligence In the last couple of years, we've looked at landing auctions. And when we've had the legal packs checked, there's nearly always something wrong. And really, that's the point. With most lots in auctions, there is nearly always something wrong. It could be to do with the build, or it could be to do with the legal packs, or something else. But there is normally a reason for it being an auction. Now, sometimes it's just people who are desperate and want a quick sale. But quite often, it's a property or a piece of land with a bit of an issue that needs sorting before you can maximise the value out of it. And it's your job leading up to the auction to find out what that is. Now, I'm quite surprised that you're struggling to find a solicitor that will help you out here. I would just look for one of the larger conveyancing firms out there. Make sure it's a conveyancing solicitor as well. They've Most of them will have experience with auctions if it's a larger firm. And if you can build up a relationship with them and prove to them that you're going to do a lot of business with them, they may be happy to skim over and, and look at an auction pack for, for no money. You may, in the beginning, need to pay them a bit of a fee to give them confidence that you're a reliable client or customer. Now, what you don't want to be doing is sending them 10 to 20 auction packs from every auction. You know, get it down to the one or two you're serious about, especially if you're looking for them to do that initial part of the work for free. Alternatively, um, you can look in the auction catalogues. There's lots of companies that advertise in auction catalogues, uh, finance companies, but obviously the one you're looking for here is a solicitor, and quite often, They advertise in auction catalogues as well. So should you be getting them checked? Absolutely. And do they exist? Absolutely. So good luck, Mark. Let us know how you get on. All right, let's have a listen to our next question. This one is from Ben in sunny Surrey. Hi, Robin Rob. It's Ben from Surrey. Uh, Love the podcast. Love the website. Keep up the good work. My question comes in relation to my dad, who runs a couple of student buy-to-let properties in the area. We're hearing rumours about changes to the HMO House of Multiple Occupancy Rules, and I just wondered if you could summarise the headlines for us, because he's getting in a bit of a tangle with regard to what he does and doesn't need to do. Yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks in advance. Thank you, Ben. Good question. Lots going on with HMOs at the moment. Seem to be loads of news coming out, so it's worth taking a minute to summarise what's changed. So the key date here is the 1st of October 2018. This is the day when the definition of an HMO changed. Previously, 
every property that had five or more people and three or more stories living as two or more households, hope you followed that, required a mandatory nationwide HMO license. Now, what's changed as of the 1st of October is they've dropped the requirement for there to be three or more stories, which makes sense because that was always a bit of a weird one. So now, if you've got five or more people living together and they're not all part of the same family, that is now nationally an HMO and will definitely require a license. So actually, the definition now is a lot more straightforward and easy to understand than it was before. So that's a national thing. On top of that, local authorities have the power to make smaller HMOs require a license as well. That's called additional licensing. So you might have only three people who aren't all the same family sharing a home. But if the local authority has decided that that requires additional licensing, then you need to go get a license for that as well. Whichever category it is, whether it's national or they require it locally, at the same time, on the 1st of October, some minimum room size legislation came into force as well. So now if you have an HMO that requires any type of license, the rooms that are used as bedrooms have to be a certain size. So for example, if there's a bedroom used by one person, it has to be at least 6.51 square metres. If it's being used by two people sharing, it has to be at least 10.22 square metres. And there are others. I'm not doing this from memory. I have looked it up. So that's what's changed as of the 1st of October. Now if you've got an HMO that already has a license because it needed one before October, then that license remains valid up until its expiry, at which point it will need to be renewed and it will need to meet the new requirements. If you've got a property that now requires a license where it didn't before, then it needed to have a license as of the 1st of October. So there's no grace period. So as of now, when we're recording this, you should have already applied for a license if you've now been brought within that definition, whereas you weren't before. And that will affect a lot of people. Apparently a couple of hundred thousand properties, they reckon, previously didn't need a license and now will do. So Ben, in your case, if your dad had a license before, then that license remains valid and you just need to check that when you come to renew it, the room sizes and everything else are as they should be. If it's got five or more people living there and only on a couple of stories, so previously it didn't need a license and now it does, then you need to apply for that license straight away because it really should have had one as of October. If in doubt, then do call the HMO department of the local authority. This new definition is bringing a bit more consistency into the definition nationally, which is helpful, but there are still lots of local variations, so there might be requirements locally that you're not aware of. So always worth getting the HMO officer on side anyway. So thank you for the question. Good to have a chance to talk about this because I'm sure it's something that a lot of people won't be aware of. And good luck. So we'll be back on Thursday with the Property Podcast and we'll be answering more of your questions next Tuesday in Ask Rob and Rob. Until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye. (laughs) 